out and take part in the memorial service for Patricia Gant yesterday. Not only was the family comforted by your presence there, but they were also very much encouraged and uplifted by that. And I was too, and I really appreciate you taking your time out of your Saturday to do that. It meant a great deal to me, and it made a great deal to them as well. You see up on the, the screen, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, this is one of those passages that was in the reading that Dalton just had for us. And in verse 7, Timothy is encouraged to reject profane and old wives' fables and rather exercise himself toward godliness. In this same chapter, in verse 11, Paul tells Timothy to, to command and teach these things. So in the same context in which this passage is given, Timothy is commanded to teach these things to the Christians that he's going to be standing before. In the same way, we need to hear this also. But for bodily exercise profits a little. And it does. Really, it, it does. You know, it's good to exercise your body. It makes you feel better. You don't have to deal with so many of life's hindrances and problems. If I don't keep myself moving right now at 45... I have abused my body so much in the past that it is very beneficial for me to exercise myself at least three days a week. And I try to do that as much as I possibly can because I wouldn't move very well if I didn't. I don't move very well right now. And if I don't keep my body moving, then I'll be even more stiff and I'll have even more problems. And so Paul was right. <laughs> Bodily exercise does profit a little. But godliness is profitable having the promise for this life, but not only this life, but for the life that is to come. So exercising ourselves toward godliness is one of the most important things that we can do. It is essential to us in our walk with the Lord. If we're going to be the disciples that we need to be, then we're going to have to make sure that we are exercising ourselves toward godliness daily. Because that is so much profit, or so much more profit to that than there is physical exercise. Because it's going to help us as we live our lives here on this earth, and it's going to make possible our lives throughout eternity in the glory of heaven. As we go through this tonight, what I'd like to do is I want to give you three keys to exercising godliness. I want to talk about what each one of those things are. I want to give you an example from the Old Testament to show how each of these things was in the life of the individual we're going to use as an example and how this person lived a life of godliness to the very end. And also we're going to make some application to ourselves in regard to these things. First of all, what I'd like to start with is that the first thing that is key to us exercising godliness in our lives is conviction. We must have conviction as people of God. Well, what am I talking about when I say conviction? Conviction defined is just being convinced and confident that something is true. Why do I go try to go to the gym three days a week? Well, I'm not trying to become a bodybuilder, obviously. You can look at me and see that. But I'm just trying to keep my body in some sort of good shape and maintain that. I'm convinced that if I do that, that that's true. That will happen. That will be the result of that. And that's why most people do that. They go because they're convinced that it's going to bring about that type of result, right? I mean, that, that is true. That's why we do that. So <laughs> since we're convinced that something is going to be true, then it produces in us a conviction that we're going to hold on to and we're going to carry that out in our lives. We take that to the realm of living before God. And I want you to look at the example of Joseph with me here in Genesis chapter 39. I want to bring you to where we are in the story here. We know that Joseph was the favorite son of his father, Jacob. His brothers hated that. So much so that they conspired a plan to get rid of him. They drew, he was sent out by Jacob to check on them as they were shepherding the flocks. Well, they conspired this plan to where they almost killed him. And Reuben, Reuben talked them out of that. But they sold him away to Ishmaelite traders who carried him down to Egypt. And as he gets down to Egypt, he finds himself being in the service of Potiphar, the commander of the Egyptian army. And that's where we find him in chapter 39. After all of this trouble, he's been taken from his father, taken from his homeland, 
taken to a foreign country, and put into slavery. But even as we find him in Genesis chapter 39, God's still taking care of him. And there's a reason for that. I want you to pick up with me at verse 6 in the life of Joseph. Speaking of Potiphar, the master of Joseph at this time, it says, So he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. And Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Did you see the statement that he makes? Listen, he's at least 400 miles away from home. None of his family's around. No one that really knows Joseph from back home can see what he's doing right now. And now there's this great temptation. His master's wife is longing for him. And he's in a position right now to where he could very well do that. And nobody else is watching either. Potiphar's not even at home. What a temptation. It would be so very easy to fall to if he did not have conviction that such was a sin against God. Did you notice how he said that he couldn't do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? That's not what he said. I cannot do this great wickedness and sin against God. Why would he say something like that? Why would a man 400 miles away from home with the eyes of his family no longer on him say something like that? It's because that he knew no matter where he was and who was around him or who was not around him that God was always watching. That an all-seeing God always had his eyes on Joseph. And Joseph knew that he could not sin against his God because he had conviction that God is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If I can quote Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Because Joseph shows us that in the life that he's living. He's not about to commit fornication. He's not to, about to give himself over to sex outside of the marriage relationship because it's a sin against God. It was then and it is now. And people with conviction of God and who God is and what God's will is in regard to this matter or any sin in regard to the lust of the flesh, the eye, and the pride of life, they are going to do their best to hold on those convictions and not sin against God. What a powerful example that we have. That's a man of conviction. In the same way, as people of God today, we must have the same type of conviction. We've got to understand as well that we are serving under the same God. He is still all-knowing, all-powerful. He's still present everywhere. There's nowhere that I can go to get away from God. I can travel 400 miles away from home, and none of you can put eyes on me. But guess who still has eyes on me? God still has eyes on me. And I need to live with the conviction that God is. And He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him because those are the ones who please God. Because they're people of faith that's coupled together with conviction. And Peter speaks of this in 1 Peter chapter 1. As he's writing to Christians and the application can be made to us as Christians today. Notice what he says in verse 13. Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves in the former lust, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And that's how we have to live our lives as Christians today. We've got to do what Peter said here in verse 13. We have to gird up the loins of our mind. We may not understand what he's talking about there. In the first century, people obviously wore long garments. And if they were going to go do some, some vigorous work, or they, even if they had to run somewhere, they would have to take up their garment and bind it up around them so it wouldn't get in the way and be a hindrance. Peter takes that to the mind. He said, you gird up the loins of your mind. You get your mind prepared. You be sober. Don't let anything be in your life or influence you that will deaden your seriousness 
toward you being focused on your convictions in regard to who God is and what He wants for you. Keep that focus in your mind. Also, you rest assured that there's something in front of you that is never going to disappoint you, and that's the grace of God. Sure, we've accessed it right now by faith, but it has not yet been fully realized. But one day when Jesus returns again at His second coming, then that grace is going to be fully realized because He's coming to take us home. But we've got to have conviction that that's real, that that's so. And that's going to dictate the way that I live my life. My mindset and my outlook on life is going to be geared toward that motivation and that hope. And what's it going to cause me to do? I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be, obe be obedient because. Because of what God has done for me. I'm not going to conform back to the ways of the world. No, I'm going to transform now. And I'm not going to be drawn into these lusts of the flesh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to keep working, keep striving to hold on to my convictions so I can battle through those things and overcome those things. Why? Because I have been set apart to a holy God. If someone has been set apart from the sinner to the saint, he's been set apart to a holy God, so what does that make me as a Christian? It makes me holy. And I can only continue to be holy if I strive to serve God in a way that He's revealed to me in His Word. And that's going to take conviction, isn't it? That's going to cause me to be convinced and confident that God is real. His will is true. And it's the most important thing in my life. And if that's the case, no matter what temptation may arise, no matter what trial can come upon us, if we will keep our minds focused on our convictions in God, and what He's revealed, we, like Joseph, with conviction, we will be able to exercise godliness in this life. We must do so if we're going to make it to heaven. But secondly, along with that conviction, if we're going to be able to exercise godliness, we also have to couple with that commitment. Commitment's just as important. Conviction's one thing, but commitment is another thing. We're talking about the state or the quality of being dedicated to a cause. I can be convicted that bodily exercise is good, right? I know a lot of people who are convicted that that's true. But that does not mean they've committed themselves to it. There's a difference, isn't it? And because that I realize that that is good for me, I'm convicted by that, but at the same time, I'm committed to it because if I don't commit myself to carrying out that exercise, it's going to be no good to me. Just believing that it's good is not enough. It's committing myself to carrying it out, being dedicated to the cause of doing that three times a week. It's essential for my health. I'm convicted of that. But how much more when it comes to godliness? What about if we go back to our example of Joseph? Let's pick up where we left off. He didn't lie with Potiphar's wife. He wouldn't do it. And she didn't like it. She so much didn't like it that she just came up with a lie and acted like it was his fault, that he had attacked her. She even took his garment away from him and had evidence to show Potiphar. Well, what, who did Potiphar believe? Well, it wasn't Joseph. Potiphar throws Joseph in prison. I mean, can you imagine the man's mindset by this time? I mean, I've been taken away from home. I've been taken away from my father. I'm no longer in my, around my own family, in my own homeland. But you know what? God took care of him. But now, I mean, here's, here, here it is noble again. Now I've, I've been wrongfully accused. I've been unjustly convicted. And now I'm in prison and I don't deserve to be here. But when you get to chapter 40, I would like you to back up. Let me show you verse 39, uh, chapter 39 and verse 23, just to begin at this point. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's hand because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. That's so significant to Joseph's understanding and outlook at this moment. The Lord's still with Joseph. And why are things still going good for him? Well, let's just find out ourselves. When you come to chapter 40, there Joseph's in prison. But again, we find him with a totally different attitude than we think someone would have in this situation. 
Look at verse 5. Let me build you up to this. Pharaoh gets angry with his chief butler and his chief baker, and he throws them into prison. So they're there, and one day they look very sad, and Joseph wants to know what's wrong with them. Look at verse 5. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison dreamed a dream, both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with his own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with them in the custody of the Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? And they said to him, We have each dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. All I want to do, I don't want to tell this whole story about Joseph. All I want to point out is, is that here's Joseph. His life in, in what we would see is just falling apart again. And now he's in prison, but how is Joseph reacting to the circumstances that surround him? Who does he realize is still on his side, and whose side is he still on? He's on God's side. Do not interpretations belong to God? Do you see who he's still giving glory to? Do you see who he's still convicted of? And what can we say? about his life. Is he not still committed? He's committed to serving that God. Well, Joseph interprets a dream. Works out good for the chief butler, not so good for the chief baker. Chief, chief butler gets reinstated into Pharaoh's house. Forgets about Joseph. <laughs> he tells Joseph, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk you up when I get back home, but he didn't do that. Well, one day Pharaoh has a dream. Can't interpret it. No one can. Chief Butler remembers, oh, yeah. Oh, boy, back in prison. He interpreted my dream, and he was right on. That brings us to chapter 41 and verse 25. Joseph is brought to Pharaoh to interpret the dream. All I want you to see here is, is what comes out of his mouth. When he's been brought out of prison, he's been brought before this great ruler who worshiped foreign gods, by the way. But notice what he has to say beginning in verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Did you catch that? God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 28, this is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 32, and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. What can we say about Joseph? After all he's been through, after all the difficult hardships and all the, the terrible circumstances that he has to face, no matter what, at the end of the day, Joseph, Joseph is still convicted and he's committed to serving his God and he knows that God's in control. No matter what's happened, He's still committed. What about us? Anybody had ever have any difficulties? How about hard times, temptations, and trials? Does sometimes your life just feel like it's falling apart? I mean, you just don't think things are going to ever go your way? And sometimes you have these great aspirations and these great hopes. You know, you, you go through a difficult time and and everything just seems so bad, but you know what? If things kind of work out better, and you're so thankful, and life's going to be better for a while now, then all of a sudden, you turn around one day, and it all happens again. It seems like everything just falls apart. Anybody been there? Sure, we've all been there, and if you haven't, you will. But do we need to allow those types of hardships and difficulties and unfortunate circumstances to cause our convictions to change? To cause our commitment just to fall apart? Well, absolutely. The answer would have to be no. We have to be committed to the God that we know is alive. And we know that His will is the best thing that we could ever carry out in our lives. I'm going to make the application in every sense come from 1 Peter. There's been a few of these high school kids that have been taking part in that study on Thursday night. And I hope they've picked up on what Elijah's been trying to carry them through. These Christians that were 
receiving this letter, immediately receiving this letter, were going through terrible suffering and persecution. It was difficult for them. You want to talk about hard times? They had obeyed the gospel, and after they've obeyed the gospel, they're having to go through all this difficulty. I mean, it's not easy. Seems like you get one step forward, you get knocked ten steps back. But Peter reminded them that you've had conviction that's brought you to serving this God through Jesus Christ. You hold on to your convictions and you be committed. What does he say in chapter 3, in verse 15? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give offense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Many times we read that word sanctified throughout the New Testament, and we realize it's talking about what Christ has done for us. He sanctified or set us apart to God through obedience to His will in regard to His atoning sacrifice. But here, the sanctification is not talking about us. It's what we do toward Christ. You sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. What does that mean? That means I set Him apart as the King and the ruler of my life. He's reigning within me. In the very soul of my mind, there is no one more important. There's no one who gets any more allegiance, any more of my obedience than the Lord God, Jesus Christ. I set Him apart there. So he dictates all of my thoughts, all of my actions. Everything that I do, say, think is dictated by the one who's reigning within me. Is that commitment or what? That's the strongest commitment you could ever make. And no matter what circumstances may arise, no matter who may come to you and ask a question of you of why you're doing this and why you're living that way, you're, you're committed. He's reigning within you, and you've always got an answer as to why. This is why, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed to suffer because of it. I'm doing that with meekness, but I also have fear, reverence, and respect for the God that I've committed myself to. I'm convicted that He's alive. I'm convicted of His will. Speak evil of me if you want to. You can speak evil of me as if I'm an evildoer. Peter says, you know what you can do? You just stand firm. One day they'll be ashamed of that. It may not be in this life, but I will guarantee you that if those who speak of us as evildoers continue that course of conduct, when they stand before the Lord in judgment on the last day, they shall be ashamed. Stand your ground. Be committed. If I have to suffer in this life right now, if it's the will of God, and it's only good because it's going to be because of the will of God. It's better for me to suffer for doing good in the eyes of God than for doing evil. If I'm having to suffer for something that I'm doing wrong, then I need to be ashamed. But if I'm suffering for doing the will of God because I have committed myself to serving Him, I'm letting Jesus reign in my heart and dictate the life that I'm living. If someone speaks evil of me, let them speak evil. One day they'll be ashamed. But how's we, how are we going to get to that place? How in the world did Joseph get to a place that he could stand in a foreign land in front of a foreign dictator after all he had been through, all the hardship and the hard time, and still be committed to his God? It's because he had conviction that went along with that commitment and allowed him to exercise godliness. And if, if we're going to be the people of God today who are going to have that same type of attitude and outlook, then we must have conviction. And we must commit ourselves to our convictions that God is alive and His will is the best thing that has ever happened to me. If we do so, we too, like Joseph, can exercise godliness. Finally, There's determination. It's one thing to be convicted that you need to go exercise. And we can all understand that, uh, you know, it's good for us. 
It can help in some areas. But just being convicted is not enough. I've got to commit myself to getting up and going and doing it. It'd be much easier just to sit on the couch. I mean, it would be much easier just not to do it because it, it takes effort. You know, it, it's not always easy. You've got to make time for it. And that's one of the problems that I find myself having is making time for it. But because I'm convicted of it and because I want to be committed to it, I have to be determined to continue to carry it out. Because I realize the good there. I've got this firm and fixed intention to achieve this desired end. And you know what that desired end is? Just so I can keep moving. I mean, some of you may feel the same way. Well, how, how much more when it comes to our, our life before God? What about Joseph? Our example has now been brought before Pharaoh. He has shown Pharaoh that he can interpret dreams. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and Pharaoh saw that the thing was good. He thought it was so good that he took Joseph and made him second in command. No one greater in Egypt except Pharaoh himself. You know what also he did? He gave him a wife. Do you know who that wife was the daughter of? The priest of On. The priest of On was the priest of the sun god in Egypt. His father-in-law was the priest of a false god. Joseph's living in a land that is not his own. He's 400 miles away from home. He's living in the midst of a bunch of idolaters. People who don't recognize his God and could care less about it. He's got family members that are close to him, one of which is the priest of the sun god, the false god that many people in Egypt worship. Do you think those could be some highly influencing factors? They very well could be. Even if a man has conviction, even if a man has been convicted, committed to serving his God, that could be a difficult situation. As the story goes on, as Joseph's ruling in Egypt, there's a famine that comes across the land. It also affects the land back home. Brothers at home, they run out of food. Guess what they have to do? They've got to come down to Egypt, and they've got to try to get some food from Joseph, of whom they don't know is Joseph, but Joseph knows them. And when they show up before Joseph that day, Joseph recognizes them immediately. But obviously, they don't recognize him. And through this series of events, what happens is, is eventually, Joseph is going to let them in on the secret. He reveals himself to his brothers in chapter 45. But what I want to point out about this is, is after all this time, after these years that he's been in Egypt, not only in the difficult circumstances, but now he's been brought out of prison. And now he's ruling over the land, and that rule and that power can really go to your head sometimes, can it? I mean, you put someone in a position of secular power, that can kind of go to their head, and they can feel like, well, I don't need anybody else. I'm it. If anyone at this time could have felt like they were it, it would have been Joseph. And again, he's got these temptations around him. All this false worship. He's got family members that have obviously have been in that worship. Father-in-law is obviously the, the main ring leader. But when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers here in chapter 45 and verse 3, I want you to notice what's still on his mind. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, 
Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made a father to, a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Did you hear what he said? After all this time and after all that he's been through, and after all the temptation that he's been surrounded in and all the prominence and popularity that's been heaped upon him, who does he still have conviction in? Who is he still committed to? And who is he determined to keep serving and bowing before and giving all the glory and the praise to no matter what happens? It's God. Because he knew at the end of the day, no matter where he was, no matter who was around him, no matter what temptations or trials he may face, he knew that God was all-powerful, all-knowing, and present everywhere. And because of that understanding, he was going to do his best to be committed to the God he's convicted of, and he's going to be determined to serve him all the days of his life. He was going to exercise godliness to the bitter end. And if Joseph can do that, under those circumstances, in that type of situation, we can do that too. As a matter of fact, we must. We stand before the same God. We serve Him. It's the same God who has blessed us. It's the same God who gives us life. And it's that God that's going to give us life more abundantly. So the application is clear, isn't it? That if we're going to exercise godly, then we have to have that same type of determination. Back in chapter 2, as Peter writes this first letter to these Christians, notice what he says to them. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Where was Joseph? He was away from home, a long way from home. He was a sojourner and a pilgrim in a land that was filled with a lot of fleshly lust that wanted to war against his soul. But what did he do? He abstained from them. Who are we? We are a people who are a long way from home. We're sojourning in a land that is not our own. Our home is heaven. This is not home. If you're a Christian and you're in this building tonight, I hope you understand that. This is not home. Do not put your roots down here. If that's the case, you will die spiritually. But if you're laying up your treasure in heaven, that's where home is because that's where Jesus is. And He's coming one day to take us back home with Him. Then you'll live your life here as sojourners and pilgrims, only knowing that I'm here just for a little while. This is not where I want to stay. Because I know this is not the end all. And I know there's going to be a lot of temptation and a lot of fleshly lust that want to war against my soul. They're out there and Satan uses them very cleverly. And he appeals to us very strongly. But if Joseph can overcome those things in a foreign land where he is, we can overcome those things right where we are right now. Because we can have the same conviction. We can have the same commitment. We can have the same determination. Don't you think that there were people who would speak evil of Joseph? I realize they probably wouldn't do it to his face because they'd only do it once. But don't you know there are people behind his back? Oh, that guy that Pharaoh's ruling over us. He, look, he serves that God that he talks about. Always giving him glory and all this. Speaking evil of him. Are people going to speak evil of us? Well, sure they are. Yes, they are. They may not do it to your face, or they may. But they're going to talk about you serving this God you're always talking about. You're always quoting Scripture. And you're always saying you got to do this, and you need to do that because of God this and God that. And they're going to speak evil of you. 
Let them speak evil. You be determined no matter what that you're not going to let that cause you to be hindered. You're not going to let that be a stumbling block to you. Because what we learn, and I believe chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 coincides with something he said in chapter 4. That when they see your good works as they're speaking evil of you, they may be speaking evil of you and they're blaspheming at that moment, but if you're standing there convicted, committed, and determined to serve God no matter what anybody else has to say, you're glorifying God in that moment even though they're blaspheming speaking evil. That's people of conviction. That's people who are committed. Those are people who are in a place where God is not in the minds of the majority. When you're in a world where they can really care less about what the Bible has to say. And you're still standing up and you're saying, I am going to serve God. He has allowed me to access His grace through salvation in Jesus Christ my Lord, and I'm not going to quit. I'm going to be committed and determined to continue to do this. I'm going to live godly for the rest of my life because I know what life is going to come in the end. That's the most important thing. You know what one of the best definitions of godliness is that I've ever heard? I, I know I've probably told you this before, but I'll tell you again. That godliness is a God consciousness, a God awareness. When I am conscious of the fact that there is a God that sees me, I'm never out of His sight, He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, then I'm going to live before that God in a way that I always do my very best to bring honor and glory to His name. I'm going to live before Him in a way to the best of my ability that I show my appreciation and gratitude for all that He's made possible for me. What's that going to take? It's going to take conviction. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take determination. But don't think that's something that's out of this world that we can't do. Joseph did it. And he's given as an example that we can do that too. Listen, bodily exercise only profits a little. I get it. That, that's just Paul's illustration. It's just mine too. Because no matter if I go back to the gym a day in my life, it is never going to be as important as me exercising myself toward godliness because it's profitable for this life and most importantly for the life to come. So no matter what you do, if you don't want to go to the gym, that's your choice. You don't have to. You may not get around very well. You may have trouble in this life, but that's just for a little while. That's our choice. But we do not have the choice as to whether or not we're going to exercise godliness. It's a must. It's, it's, it's necessary if we're going to get to heaven. But what the Bible wants us to know is that we can do it. We can do it because Joseph did it. And Joseph is one of those people that we have in Hebrews chapter 11 that says, by faith, Joseph. When he was dying made mention of his departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. What's my point? My point is that when Joseph came to the end of his life, he died in faith. And he exercised godliness right up to the moment that he died. And if he can do that, we can do that too. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it with conviction. We're going to do it with commitment. And we're going to do it with determination. With our God's help, we can do it. And we can go to heaven. And tonight, I hope this has encouraged you to do just that. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian and you haven't made possible your salvation through Jesus Christ, we want you to know that there's no better time than right now to do that. If you understand what the Bible teaches in regard to that, if you need to talk about that more, if you need more understanding, we're here to talk with you about that. Please come to me, come to Andrew, come to one of our elders. Just make it known to someone that you have questions. We're here to help you get to heaven. And tonight, if you haven't been exercising godliness as a Christian, as you should, 
there's no better time than now to ask for the prayers of the local church. You may need help. You may need to study something. You may have some hindrance in your life that's causing you to wander and waver, but it doesn't have to remain that way. If we can do anything tonight to help anyone make their life right with God and begin exercising godliness, won't you come while we stand and we sing this song?